couple perks of not having the men around. We dance more freely, I've noticed. We hot tub more freely. But I miss the shofars. <laughs> Have you noticed there's no men and then there's no shofars? I know you have them back home. I didn't put it on the packing list. It's okay. <laughs> Next year I'll get a shofar vendor and then we'll be all set. <laughs> that was beautiful. You guys sing nice. You dance nice. Let's do that song again tomorrow. <laughs> all right. Let's, Evelyn. Oh. <gasps> We need a shofar. Well, I was looking for the shofars all day, but I ain't seen nothing shofar. <laughs> I one memed up you. <laughs> one minute. So, I want to. There's so many things I want to talk with you about, and um, one of them is, and I don't talk about this very often. It's actually kind of hard, but this is such a great opportunity with you here can't pass it up. I want to talk to you about Taurus Sisters and what I um, want to do with this community in the future. But I don't want to do it during this time. Um, I'm going to do it after this chapel time. So if you want to stay and hear what I have in mind for Taurus Sisters going forward, um, stick around afterwards. We'll just do it right here. I might use the mic if there's a lot of you because I don't like to talk loud. Um, and we'll just hang out in here and you can hear my vision and then um, throughout the rest of our stay maybe you can give me your feedback and ideas that way we don't all have to sit and listen to everybody's feedback because I won't, you want to go hot tub too but is that okay so if you want to stick around afterwards another breakout session late night with Amy here afterwards because <laughs> I want your feedback okay I'm going to totally switch gears now let's get serious um, we miss Jamie There's a sniffle station. Go get it. Jamie Bauer died last week. Most of you know that. Some of you might not, and that's okay. Uh, her, she and her husband had a ministry, have a ministry called New to Torah, and it just started really organically years ago. It helped me come into this walk because that pointed me to go home and read my Bible. And a lot of it was Zach on the front end. We all know Zach really well, but there's always a good wife behind a good man. Because for him to take all that time to prepare all of that is no small thing. And then they moved out off grid, and she, she's a good woman. She got a terrible cancer about a year ago, and she died last week, Thanksgiving Day. Uh, she was supposed to be here with us this week. She had bought a ticket to be here. Um, and I, I've thought about her a lot. Now, there's some ladies with us who know her very well. They fellowship. They're from that area. They have lost a big hole. Um, so uh, you may have seen them. Sometimes they just cry, probably. And then the next minute they might laugh because grief looks different for everybody. And there's nothing wrong with you cry one minute and you laugh the next. And it might be something totally unrelated. And anything can trigger it. So I, we've already been here for a whole day and a half, but I hope those ladies have felt loved and treasured and accepted in their grief. I'm sorry you have to grieve here, but I'm really glad you're here with us. I'm so glad you came. I'm so glad I guess that worked out in some strange, sad way. I would have rather had Jamie here. By far. Uh, if you don't know where to find she has lush for us because the father is good and he um i guess in his sovereignty has left us many videos a treasure of videos of jamie so an, an americanhomestead.com a youtube channel you can see lots of videos of her cooking and talking and homeschool talking oh, that was a good one um one of them, she even talks about my magazine, and that was such an honor. She wrote an article for the magazine, and I wish she could have written a thousand more. I wish I could have met her. Um,
go and search out her videos. I do want to read something though. So as she was, she was sick and then they thought some treatment might be helpful and then she got sick again and I think she started to know that the worst might happen. And she wrote a letter to the whole community about what's kind of what's helpful and what's not and it's it's on her, their patreon account it's also on Taurus sisters so since you know Taurus sisters go there it's the last blog post it's her letter uh, can i read you part of it this is her she, i'm not going to read the whole thing just a couple paragraphs she had been talking about um why do these things happen she leaves behind two little kids you guys so here's what she wrote i think or she says, asking why is a fruitless question. I think we have to be okay with, I don't know. It's easy to say that, but it's so much harder to do through pain and fear. It's a discipline of the mind to take every thought captive. But our Father knows that. Again, these are Jamie's words. <laughs> I decided months ago that we would talk about how to be women of shalom. We could, I could just read this and we could all go home because it's all here. Go and read this later. Some of you already have. Most of you have. Sorry, sorry. She says, but our Father knows that. He sees our struggles to understand, and I believe that as we praise him and honor him through the pain and fear, it becomes a true sacrifice to him. It's a sacrifice of praise when we have to choose to let go of the questions and praise him through them. She says, it's a choice daily hourly she hurt a lot you guys so when she says it's a choice hourly she knew what she was talking about and she says even more to declare that even though my body is sick she declared it is well it is well with my soul which was her favorite hymn and it really is well with my soul I can confidently say that my faith is stronger today than it has ever been I know he loves me with tender mercies that I see almost daily. He has shown me his love over and over as I have poured out my heart to him. And here's, she says, it is my prayer for anyone reading this that you hold on to him too. Don't let your own why questions steal your communion with him. Yeshua tells us that in this world we will have trouble, but he, what has he done? He's overcome the world. So no matter what, he, she says, we run the race for him. And it is our hope to be counted with the sheep as we hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. She, everything we're doing here, she just said. Um, it's weird to love someone you've never met. <laughs> I wish I had been had the privilege to fellowship with her on Shabbats too, but I'm glad we were all in community with her. She served us tremendously. Um, she wouldn't want you to look up to her, I don't think, but I think it's okay to go and watch her videos, read her stuff on the blog, glean from her, talk about her, pray for Zach and the boys. They have a new kind of different now. It's just a new kind of different. And Zach is strong. He'll be all right. But it's going to be different. So pray for them as they adjust and get used to this. Don't forget them. Sometimes when people go, then two, three, six months, two years later, we can still send them a card, send them a message, and pray for them, okay? All right. Let's switch gears again. You guys are great. It's okay to talk about her. It's okay to talk about her. We're not going to dwell on it the whole weekend. But she comes up all the time. Thinking about her just comes up. And you can cry whenever you want to cry, and you can laugh whenever you want to laugh here. Okay? It's been hard. We wish she was here, but it's okay. It's going to be okay. Katie Abafi is going to come share with us now. Sorry that was such a hard segue, but it's all... Yeah, um, her friend is saying that Jamie wanted us to be okay. I know she'd want us to party and have a good time, right? It's okay because you can do both. You don't have to choose happiness or grief. You can sort of somehow, you just have to live it all at the same time. 
Is that okay to say? I've never lost anyone close to me, so I, I don't want to say the wrong thing. Grief is not my specialty. Um, it's a great loss in our community. Really, really great. All right, Katie, come talk. Come keep helping us learn about Shalom and all of these things. You're going to do great. Hi. Jamie was wonderful. I got to meet her one time. And Zach, I mean, yeah, Luke. Luke and I got to go to their place in Arkansas and meet their guard donkey. I didn't know there was such a thing. And she was so sweet and kind. And one of my favorite parts in the way is when she talks about how the Torah is these amazing practical instructions for just daily loving people. And I was glad that it was an important thing to articulate because people don't always see it that way. Um, and I think that is what it is at the heart. And I'm glad that she shared that. And, and uh, yeah. Okay. Peace. <laughs> Do you guys have the program? The title of this particular talk is like very long and weird. I renamed it like 17 times in my head and I forget the order like an organic, all naturally peaceful home, a peaceful, organically natural home. Oh, okay. <clears throat> this is not a, a conversation about lavender essential oils. I kind of want to like fake you out and make you think it's going to be about like how to have like a mattress with no flame retardants so you could like sleep better. It's not about anything like that. Raise your hand if you've ever had or seen a screensaver of like a nature escape. Right? Why do we do that? How come it's not a picture of like your kid's messy room or like the gym that you don't go to or the grocery store? How can we always have these nature pictures on our phones? Yeah, it's beautiful, it's peaceful. So we hope that just looking at it infuses a little bit of peace into our day. And not only do we all think nature is peaceful, it actually is. It's like scientifically proven to calm us. And I found these studies that were done by some medical university in England. I'd never heard of it, you probably never heard of it, so I won't even trouble us with the name. But the findings are what's important. They said, we gathered evidence from over 140 studies involving more than 290 million people, which sounds like a lot, to see whether nature really does provide a health boost. That's what they were tracking with. The research team studied data from 20 countries. We found that spending time in or living close to natural green spaces is associated with diverse and significant health benefits. Thanks. <laughs> um, <laughs> it reduces the risk of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, premature death, preterm birth, increases sleep duration. I'm getting to the part that's salient for this, so just track with me for a minute. People living closer to nature had a reduced diastolic blood pressure. Their, their blood pressure was lower and they had reduced heart rate and stress. In fact, one of the really interesting things we found is that exposure to green space significantly reduces people's level of salivary cortisol, like the physiological marker of stress. So like they were literally just less stressed being in nature. So it's not just like in our heads, this actually is like physiologically like doing something when we're in nature. And so I started thinking like, what about nature makes it so peaceful? And, Okay, so I'm gonna draw a picture for a second. I'll try to draw it so it's not in like down low in Hobbit world where I live. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's you. This is your thought bubble. I'm gonna read these out loud just in case you can't see what I'm writing. Why am I writing at an angle? This is weird.
Yes. Okay. So if I or like many of us would try to dream up what a peaceful scenario would be, let's say like in our homes, like how do you make a peaceful home? These are five things that I often think about. It's quiet. It is still stasis. It's not moving around. Everyone's not freaking out. Everyone's just still, like sit down. It's spotless, it's clean, and it's comfortable, and I have control, <laughs> right? These are the five things we need to have a peaceful home. That's what we think. Have you ever been frustrated that your house is not more peaceful? Ah, a heavy sigh and a nod, yes. Me too! Have you ever thought, like, I just need some peace and... Look! Silence! We think we need silence to have peace. Or like, or have you ever said, and I've kind of fallen into this trap lately when we get in the thick of trying to like release this documentary, like, when everything slows down, it's just gonna be so... Which it will, but... Should I just like live in wrenching unpeace? That's not a word, but until then, no! Like, or have you felt like, oh, it's a losing battle keeping this place clean. It's just so like robbing my peace. Because I feel like I'm not, you know. <gasps> By the way, this is just like a side nugget. But there's this woman named Misty Winkler who has like a, do you know who this is? Oh, she has a podcast kind of thing. And she, was, she talks about like homemaking a lot. And she said something that like freed me so much. I was like, this is amazing. This must be shared. She was talking about like housework and stuff and how it can feel really futile when it's like you wash the dish and someone immediately comes and like makes it dirty again. You make the bed, it's immediately rumpled. You do the laundry and then people wear the clothes and dirty them again. And you're like, Arr! you know, it's so frustrating. And she said the goal of like housework is not that everything stays immaculate, but that the items and your home, everything is ready for use. I was like, oh. So like I'm washing this dish because I love my family and I want it to be ready for use the next time they need it. It'll make their lives smoother. And it's such a like little tweak, but it's such a different feeling than feeling like, why am I doing this when it's going to get dirty in four seconds? Because you're making it ready for use for your family. And I was like, this helps me a lot, actually. Anyway, on and on we go. We have all of our things that we think that we need to have a peaceful situation. But the truth is, we don't need any of that stuff to have peaceful homes. And ironically, I think all of those things are actually like out of our control anyway. It's like, can you really, I don't know, you can try to make people silent for like, it's not gonna last very long, or you can try to clean, it's not gonna last very long, likely. These things are kind of largely out of our control oftentimes. And the way that I knew that we didn't need these things to have peace is because nature, the most peaceful thing, doesn't have any of them. And when our Heavenly Father designed like the most peaceful situation, he didn't do any of those things in nature. And here, so this is what I've been thinking about. Like, have you been to the beach? It's kind of loud sometimes, like the ocean waves crashing. Or like, have you been outside in the summer when the frogs are all like, I don't know what they're doing, in heat? It's like really loud and they're like <laughs> mating calls back and forth and like, and we play these like nature soundtracks sometimes to fall asleep and it's not quiet, but it's really peaceful. Hmm. And uh, so nature is often loud just like our homes. And then the stasis thing, the stillness, the like wanting everything to stop so you can just relax. Um, but have you ever seen like in a field, my father-in-law planted like winter, winter rye or something as like a cover crop in one of his like gardens. It grew up really fast and it got super tall. And then the breeze was coming through one day and it was like hypnotic, the movement of it. It was really relaxing. And or have you seen like birds and they are in this big flock and then they like swoop all at once. And it's so pretty. And so nature has all this movement constantly. Everything is teeming and moving, but it's still so peaceful. That doesn't stress us out for some reason. Spotlessness. Nature is not clean. It's where the dirt is and the mud and the grass stains. You know what I mean? Like, 
Have you ever, I mean, to me, it's relaxing to be like working in a garden. You get dirt under your nails and like getting dirty is part of the relaxing peacefulness of it somehow, like the dirt itself. So we don't need things to be like spotless and sterile and clean really to have peace and um, comfort. The next one is, I'm sure maybe you guys have like hiked or something and you're in mountains and you sit on a rock and it's so peaceful and wonderful, but you're sitting on a rock. You're not on like, I don't know, some fancy mattress. And it doesn't need to be comfortable. It's still super peaceful. Um, and the last is control. And this is a big one because sometimes when you feel out of control, it's hard to feel like you have peace in your home or whatever. But have you ever been to a waterfall? <laughs> How much of that can you control? Zero. And that's super peaceful too. So then I started thinking, I was like, if both nature and our homes are noisy often, they're in motion, they're lived in, sometimes they're uncomfortable, sometimes stuff feels out of our control, are there other factors that are what is making nature peaceful and not the ones that I kind of thought it was initially? So then I was like praying about that, thinking about that, and then I thought of three things. I love lists. Does anyone else find lists very comforting? I'm like, if I could just organize like the multiplicity of the universe into like a three bullet point list, that just makes my heart feel good. All right, so here are the three things that I think our Heavenly Father put into nature that actually are really relaxing, and they are all things that we can implement in our lives and in our homes. So that's like encouraging to me because it's not the stuff that I can't really control, it's stuff that I, that I could. Okay, so you, if you're taking notes, here's number one. Reliable rhythms. Bless you. Number two, self-sustaining systems. And the last one is gentle transitions. I like that one. And I just want to share what I was thinking about each of these as I was like praying about it and trying to figure out. I kind of see these things in nature and I see kind of how they make it peaceful and how can we also do that in our lives. So the first thing, the reliable rhythms. I think I've read also, you know, in psychology things, that human beings, we need like both variability and stability to feel good. Like we are growing, but not bored. And like learning, but not untethered. You know, it's like a, a balance. And I think that God knew that we would need both when he created nature because you have this, this rich variability, the colors, the smells, the, you know, the noises, the taste but you also have things that will happen like clockwork and both occur. So like, it may or may not snow later, but like after it's nighttime tonight, it'll definitely be morning tomorrow. So you have bankable rhythms in nature that will never change. And you even hear like in the word, uh, God making promises like as surely as day and night, you know, he's like even evoking how consistent these things are when he, when he says things often. And uh, I think that he knew that these reliable rhythms would help us feel rooted in our lives and not just like everything is variable, like weather. Um, so I thought maybe sometimes our homes are lacking peace because we're lacking those reliable rhythms, those like touch point things. And I think that's been true for me before. Like, I don't know, Luke and I would have stuff we do. Because when you kind of, we kind of like work from home, it's like life and work flow into each other. and and there's, it's kind of like every day is different and it, sometimes it doesn't feel like you have those like set things. We do have one rhythm. We eat the same thing for breakfast every single day. Just like fried eggs and toast. Um, so that's comforting to me. We also used to like try to, when we were eating breakfast, listen to three chapters of the Bible with that guy, the guy with the really rich like Shakespearean voice reading KJV. And like that was just like a thing we did every morning. We kind of fell off on that, but we should get back to it because it was a nice like anchor every morning just to have a little bit of time in the Word together um, before we get started. So 
do you guys have like anchors in your day in your month in your week I mean in your week probably like Shabbat is a thing that like anchors your family and do you have reliable rhythms or do you just feel like everything is like it's a toss up it's a grab bag it's a free for all who knows who knows what'll happen that's kind of tiring sometimes and I think it feels not very peaceful sometimes but but maybe if you feel like you're tossed around a lot or there isn't structure like adding in those touch points I know people say that's important for like kids too so it makes me more want to like oh no Max needs rhythms he's gonna be like all (laughs) and sometimes these things it might not be like adding something because like who wants to add something (laughs) every day at four o'clock I gotta like you know touch my toes or whatever it might just be like every night an hour before bed I'm gonna turn off all the electronics that's gonna be a rhythm that I have just to help me like ease into sleep time or something like that okay so the second thing is self-sustaining systems one thing that I find relaxing about nature is like you step into like a field or something and you're just like oh No one is asking anything of me because all of this is working outside of me. Like everything is doing its job. The water cycle is doing its job. The moon and the tides and the bees are pollinating and like every, every thing, every piece is doing its work. Everything is staying in its lane, you know? And it's like you can relax kind of because it's not all on you to like hold this all together. You can kind of just witness how it all works beautifully together. And that is very peaceful. And nature's not how like our homes are. The ants aren't like, oh, we're doing everything over here and like the lazy frogs are just sitting around <laughs> mooching off of my hard work. You know, like everything's doing its piece. And there's not that like resentment of like, I'm doing more than you are, or, like I'm overtaxed and all that stuff. Um, but it's easy for our homes to get like that where like you feel like you're holding everything together or it's just burdensome or you see like a, Maybe things aren't delegated according to people's strengths, or I don't know. Um, And of course, there are always like seasons in your life. Maybe you have like big projects, or maybe you have like little kids, and there are just a lot of things that are on your shoulders. But I think that sometimes there are self sustaining systems, like the ones that our Heavenly Father has put into nature that could help our homes a lot, have more peace. Um, I've been asking myself lately can anything be automated? Can I teach one and a half year old Max to do anything that will take work off of my plate? (laughs) And also give him a life skill. He's really good at, well this isn't like a self-sustaining system yet, but like I can take something from the washing machine and like hand it down to him at max level and he'll like pop it in the dryer. And between each item he's like so ready to close the door and push the button, but I'm like, no there's more, there's more, there's a whole thing more. But I try to think about ways I can do this because but here's, here's my real example of like, this is really silly, but this is a, a system that I think that I actually need because I have a chair that robs me of peace very often. Do you guys know what clergy clothes are? Not quite clean, not quite dirty. Do you guys have the chair when like at the end of the day, you just went out one place, your clothes aren't really dirty, so, but you don't want to hang them back up. It's it's not that clean, but it's not dirty enough to go in like the laundry basket. So they end up on the chair. And then the chair ends up looking like a person. It's like all the stuff and I'm like, oh, this chair. It's so frustrating. And after like months of looking at these chairs, I'm just like, Luke, we need two hooks for the clergy clothes. And the in-between, not quite clean, not quite dirty clothes are going to go on these hooks so that I'm not constantly dealing with this chair and looking at this chair. It's making me feel like a failure. It's a big deal. (sighs) Do you guys have this? Or do you just wash your clothes after you wear them? Which is normal. If you need to have a clergy clothes hook, four hooks, then do it if that saves sanity, if that's a system that creates peace. If all of us can go and know, okay, I'm gonna put the clothes not quite clean, not quite dirty on this hook instead of the chair so that I don't have to go back later and like sort out where this is supposed to go because there's no home for it. The last thing is gentle transitions. This is a weird one, a weird thing about nature that makes it peaceful that I hadn't thought about before, but 
Have you ever noticed how like a sunset isn't just like stripes? Wouldn't that look so gross? Just like of like discrete blocks of color. But it's like ombre, you know, like the whole thing people were doing with their hair and with their wall, wall painting and it's like gradual and it's pretty. Or like have you noticed how God doesn't just like flick on the lights in the morning, black to bright, morning! It's like gradual. Or it doesn't just jump from like, you know, spring to summer. Although sometimes it feels like the seasons do kind of like, like where did that come from? But things are gradual and like, you know, children grow in like little by little, you know, a baby in the belly. It's like little by little, so it's not just like heavy all of a sudden and you're like, what? Um, because gentle transitions are more peaceful. And sometimes the most stressful part of your day is just trying to like transition between work and like being at home or like being in kid brain and then like spending time with your husband or something or you know or like getting everybody out of the house so you can go to like wherever you meet for Shabbat or go to the grocery store or something. Those transitions are like really crunchy sometimes. And uh, so at first, I couldn't figure out how this could translate into our house, into our lives and our, our homes and stuff. And I was praying again, and I found this TED talk about something called the third space. Have you guys heard of this? So this guy was studying like elite performers in different fields, and he started with tennis players. And he was like, what's the difference between the like best of the best tennis players and just professionals who don't make it up there? And he realized after like interviewing all these guys that it was how they managed the gap in between points in their tennis match. So like the top of the top would, in between points, if they had made a mistake in the last point, they, they would shed that. They would shed like the emotion associated with that. And then they would, they would relax. Their blood pressure would actually be lower than like really good players than like the guys that were just ranked below them in between points. And they would focus on the execution of what came next and not like the outcome. So instead of being like, oh, I hope I get the next point, I really, really need it, they'd be like, okay, like the mechanics of the swing or whatever. And then he started studying CEOs and other just high achieving people and they all had this like similar thing about how they managed the gaps or the transitions in their day and their life. And he was like, this is a thing, this is a third space. And so, as he began to talk about this, I was like, this is actually a thing that we can implement to have gradual, gentle transitions in our day that bring more peace. And he has a little, there's like a three-step thing. Maybe I should draw it. Okay. So, So you have like space number one, space number two. Let's say space number one is home with kids. Space number two is you gotta get to the grocery store. And let's say this is all crazy over here. There's just crazy madness going on. And then you gotta get to the grocery store and like be normal and actually get your food. So he's like, most people miss that in between space number one and space number two, there's this third space in the middle. And that's what his whole like talk and I think book is about. And so he, he gives three things that you can do while you're transitioning between one phase of your day and another to create more peace. So the first one is reflect, then rest, then reset. And so basically you're between, you know, house with the kids and the grocery store. And so you to reflect, you kind of think about what has just happened, but like Christy said before about training your mind to like have the positive thoughts and like deciding what kind of thoughts you have, you ask yourself basically, what just went well about space number one that I'm leaving? Maybe that's the kids played well together, or they didn't kill each other, or I didn't kill them. Whatever it is, you find a win from the space that you're leaving so that you can 
Because he said when, you, when you're mindful of like what went well or what you did well, you're more likely to replicate that behavior later. And so he was talking about like people in work and stuff like that, like what were your wins for the day? And if you just, just take a moment to find one positive thing or even something that you're grateful for, for the time that you're leaving, that can help you transition gently into the next space. So that's reflect, find something positive, what went well with where I'm coming from. Then there's rest, which is just like, can you get like 30 seconds and just breathe? Just like, just give yourself a minute. Literally just give yourself a minute, which is simple and easy to do. And maybe space number one and space number two are like work and home. So maybe like in the car on the way home, you're just having a minute to just like rest and transition. And then the last thing is reset. And all you do is you ask yourself, who do I wanna be in space number two? How do I want to show up to the grocery store? Do I want to be clear about what I'm getting, firm but kind with my kids, and courteous to the checkout lady? Whatever it is. So you kind of, you think about that next place so that you don't, and what you want to bring there and who you want to be there so you don't drag any like crunchiness from the previous space into the new space. Does that make sense? So before I share this with you guys, I wanted to test it to make sure it actually worked. And I had the perfect opportunity like two weeks ago because my brother-in-law, his fiance was going wedding dress shopping and I was gonna go with her and I'd arranged it that Luke would you know, be with Max during that time and stuff so that it could be like all about the bride and we could like squeal. And then at the last minute, Luke's like, it's really busy, I need you to just take Max. And I was like, what? I was getting myself ready. He's not ready, he needs to be changed, he hasn't had lunch, blah, blah, blah. I'm like freaking out and we're like gonna be late, we have to drive an hour to Columbus to this bridal shop and stuff like that and I was just frazzled and I was kinda like, this isn't what we agreed on. I was like a little bit mad and, um, and I was like, mm, this is one of those third space things, I'm gonna test it. So I thought, okay, I did the like reflect thing. I was like, I actually got some work done today while Max was playing with his bulldozer and um, and then I rested. I just took a shower. <sighs> Do you guys love shower time? I stay in there for days, just planning my life, everything, conversations I wanna have in the future. So I took a shower, that was my like rest. And then I thought, Vanny, her name is Evangeline, is getting married. This is so exciting, you know? This is a time where she's like trying on wedding dresses and I want to be celebrating with her. I want to be like cheering with her and this is like a really memorable thing. She'll probably remember this for a long time and so I want this to be awesome for her and I don't want to bring in the fact that like there's a lot going on right now. I didn't think I was going to be bringing this baby and blah, blah, blah. you know I want to bring just energy and excitement for her for, so it can, be, it can be a fun thing and be like all about her and da da da. And I just kind of thought that in my head. And then even on the drive up I felt great. I felt peaceful. I didn't feel flustered about the baby thing, even though he puked in the car, apples all over the car on the way up. He was fine. He just, he stuffs them in because he gets excited, but he hasn't like thoroughly like chewed. But anyway, it went wonderfully and I felt like that just taking the moment to do those like three things really quick was helpful for me. So you guys can try it and see if it's helpful for you too. But I vetted it at least a little bit. I tested it once. So I'm basically done. All I wanted to say was that I think that I like finding answers to questions in the word and in like nature because I think there's so much there. And I think that knowing what, uh, not focusing on the things that we like can, can, can't control, but on the things that we can, will give us good expectations about how to have more peace in our homes and in our lives and all that. All right, I lost my cell phone. If anyone sees it, it's mine. Is it? It's a sign. I'm too attached to it. I'm okay, really. Take your tea. Take your water or I'm going to share. Huh, whatever. Okay. <laughs> so, so much of what I, not so much, but some of what I was going to say in today's talk and tomorrow's talk Christy and Katie have already talked about. And that's a nice thing. 
That means the Father had us all lining up to make sure things complement each other and we send you home with the kind of message that he wanted us to send you. We didn't spend a ton of time coordinating every little detail. In fact, we deliberately just kind of wrote our topics and kind of went with it. And it's been really fun to see how they're playing out. Um, have you enjoyed the messages so far? You're going to go home with some new ideas, some practical things, some heart change, and then some practical. That's what I'm all about. Um, what time is it? Where are we at? It's 8.11. We're doing good. Can I tell you a little of my, my testimony? A little of my story? Um, and by the way, I know you, you ladies sit for a long time. If you need to get up and get your wiggles out, it's okay. I'll keep on going. Uh, I've been keeping Torah about six years. I think I'm coming up on my seventh Passover. I mark by Passover. So that's my, that was my first feast. Who marks their Torah time by a feast? What, whatever one it is. Um, or like, what have I done? Like 400 Sabbaths or something. <laughs> that's weird. That's if you're brand new to Torah, and that's pretty exciting too. This is my fourth Sabbath. We all did that. Um, I was in the mainstream Christian church, doing church ministry, the whole thing. Um, I'll admit I was a little lukewarm. I was a little, little lukewarm, and I look back, and I only can blame myself. I can't put that on someone else. I blame my lukewarmness on myself. Um, but I do remember thinking, I'm glad I have someone to tell me what the Bible means. Because it doesn't all make sense to me. So I'm so glad I have these good pastors. And they were good pastors. Um, you know, they just don't see some things, don't they? Some important things. So uh, a, a short story. My, a, fr a lady I knew, a friend of mine, started posting some crazy stuff on Facebook about the feasts and things. And then she said something really awesome. And every time, though, she said, go read the scripture and see it for yourself. It's in there. And I thought she was falling from grace. And so I decided for some weird reason, I wasn't even that close to this lady, I decided, oh, that's easy, I can save her. Because I can show her from scripture that this stuff is wrong. You don't have to do Sabbath and stuff like she was talking about. That's gonna be so easy to show her. If she thinks that scripture is the authority, as did I, piece of cake. So I didn't tell her, but I, start, I started out on what I thought would be a quick little Google search for some Bible verses to show her where she was wrong. And you know where that landed, here I am. <laughs> and it, it actually went pretty quick for me. I don't know why, but well, I do know why. 10 weeks later, I was getting ready to do my Passover. Kim Phelps was there with me. We were coming out and doing this stuff at the same time. That's why I look at her, because we were right there going, you see it too? Who are you? Because <laughs> we were local to each other, it was fun. Um, so I read my whole Bible, cover to cover. Um, looked at the church fathers, looked at commentary on both sides. I was very fair and balanced. And uh, I had a, long story short, here I am. Um, I, I was married then. I told my husband, really think we're supposed to do this stuff. And he said, you can do that crazy stuff, but don't tell the kids about it, and I'm not doing it. So in other words, he was sort of tolerant, but I had some limitations. And I thought he and everyone else I knew would just start seeing this right away too. And of course, that did not happen. Um, I cried out to God. Nobody's taping this, right? Don't. Well, I guess we're recording it. I haven't said a lot of this publicly yet. So if I let this go out, it's just, it's okay. So I'm going to tell you some of my story. I'm looking at Anne now because Anne walked through these hard times with me. When I look at you, you have to look in my eyes. Help, helps me keep going. Um, my husband did not see these things. Um, so I kind of did it on the down low. Torah on the down low. And if that's the where you, at, where you are and you have to do Torah on the down low, you're doing Torah and he's honored by that. Um, I, not everybody agrees with me and I'm not going to preach about this. I believe that wives should submit to their husbands, and I believe that that's a fairly weighty matter. And I believe that it's more weighty than, um, than breaking Sabbath. And we don't have to discuss that right here, right now, but that's where I was. That's where I still am. So I submitted to my husband, um, and I didn't tell the kids about any of this. I was able to join with other believers on Sabbath, some Sabbaths, and I just told them I was going to a Bible study. So I honored my husband when he said, do it on the down low. I did it on the down low the best I could. 
my first Passover was just me eating some lamb and some bitter herbs and they were like watching cartoons or something at the same time I was all alone even though my family was all around me very strange but I'll never forget it because it was amazing Passover um, and I think we watched you know the Moses movie a cartoon or something um, so that's how I was walking for a year and a half crying out to the father to bring my husband into it um, like crying myself to sleep every night because it's really lonely like that it's weird to be now we um, well it's just a hard thing if you know anyone walking through this just love them you don't always have to give them advice just say that's got to be really hard sometimes that's all you have to say um, and if they ask you for advice go to the Bible and show them in Scripture what to do in those situations but nobody came to Torah <laughs> for a long time. Um, after about a year and a half of this, I found out my husband was having an affair and that then he promptly filed for a divorce and there was no stopping and it was just a freight train that he was driving and in the state of Michigan as in 48 other states, when someone files for a divorce, they get a divorce. A lot of people misunderstand and they think that you somehow sign a paper and consent. That's not really true. The only paper you sign is to say, I want some of the kids and I want some of the stuff. That's the only paper you sign. If you don't sign that paper, he gets everything. So I say that so you, again, give compassion to people going through this. Someone files for the divorce, they're getting the divorce. There was no counseling. I begged for it. There was no nothing. It was just freight train. Am I okay? I have my kids' permission to tell you this, by the way. My kids are getting big. I never talked about it until they're the age that they are now. And I've been asking them for months, what do you think? Because I want to really make sure it's okay with them. And it's okay because this is their story. I think it's their story more than it's my story because I get to sort of move on with my life, right? They're stuck with this forever. So this is their story. And they're awesome, by the way. My kids are okay, which brings me to the next thing. So I'm divorced and I got stressed out. There's no, I didn't just decide to talk about being women of Shalom for no reason. It's because this is what I have been working on for how long have I been divorced? So four and a half, five years. Um, and I went through some rotten stuff and I acted rottenly sometimes and I just want to save other women from that. And some of you have gone through or will go through way worse stuff than that. Way worse. Um, so when people say someone has it worse, I know it's true. That was rotten enough. But so then started the fear. <laughs> and I look at Anne again, because Anne was there, and I would call her a lot. I'm afraid of this, and I'm afraid of that, and I'm afraid. Where am I going to live? I thought I'd have to move in with my parents, and they don't observe Shabbat and stuff. And I would have been grateful to them. They were so generous to let me and the kids move in with them. But that would have been a hardship. But I would have done it. <laughs> I really wanted to keep on homeschooling. How does a single mom homeschool? Like, how does that even, how? Nobody, does, I know now a lot of women do that, but not easily. And some women can't do it. So I had all these fears, mainly about money and homeschooling, um, along with all the hurt. I'll tell you, am I okay telling this stuff? You know, a lot of us came to Torah and we started to understand like we're Israel. Who had that huge revelation as part of coming to Torah? Some people sort of already knew that, but for me, it was a whole new way of looking at the scriptures, of understanding that this is what they say. Like, we are Israel, and all of their complaining was me, and all of their idol worship was me. Those were my forefathers, and one way or another, blood or grafted in, it doesn't matter. Those are my people. I'm one of them, and I'm not into some other group that's better than them and can say, those rotten people and then me. So that was huge for me. And that was when I came to Torah. And then a year and a half later, I'll never forget you guys. I found out about my husband's affair by opening his email. And at that moment, I didn't think he was having an affair. I really didn't. I didn't think I was going to find anything in his email. I thought I was going to just whatever. But when I read it, within moments, 
I realize how the father felt when they hoard with other idols and other nations. He was a husband to them, and they hoard against him. I was like, oh, do you remember that? It's not so weighty on me now, but in those early days, like I felt the father's pain of having a cheating spouse. And somehow I needed to go through that. Stop crying for me. It's okay, because we're going to have hope, and we're going to talk about, look at me, Anne. Am I better now? Am I okay? I was not in a good place. She cried with me a lot because she's a good friend. We sinned against him so bad. Anyway, so apparently I needed to learn that too somehow. I'm, I tried to, this rottenness that I went through, take away as much of it that I can use to be more like Yeshua. And apparently I had to learn that hardcore gospel lesson of what it's like to be cheated on. And I wanted restoration with my husband. I begged and cried out for it. But would it have ever been the same? I don't think it would have ever been the same. I think a lot of marriages can heal and recover, but really it's a brand new marriage when that happens. I believe after adultery, when a couple reconciles and gets back together, it's kind of a whole new covenant. Because that first covenant was broken by the adultery. Anyway, that's a gospel sideline. Because that's the gospel. That's the gospel. Um, so then I had all these just practical fears. Um, I got really, I look back now and I realize I was not well. The stress whoa, wrecked my body. Not completely wrecked, but I was not well. Um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. Fear after fear after fear. And God sent good people, Anne and my sister and others, to say, Amy, are you going to be okay tomorrow? I was like, well, yeah. I have clothes and money for in a place to live tomorrow. Then do tomorrow. So for a while, that's how I did it. I did it tomorrow. And then I did tomorrow, and then I did tomorrow. And I would start making plans. And, you know, the father just took care of everything. I got these weird little gigs and jobs. I was doing some freelance weirdo work back then. And got these little gigs and jobs and stuff. And he took care of one thing at a time. And as time goes on, he just conquered one fear after another after another by answering only what I needed right now. Someone said, you don't get to see the end. You just see what's right here in front of you. He doesn't always show you the whole thing. Or he, just, he didn't show me. So I had to just walk one day at a time, trust him, gather my manna, and just do that day. One Sabbath to the next. That's how I lived. Um, so I just... You just get used to things. You get used to a new different. And you miss the old sometimes. But you get used to a new different. And then after a while, you can learn to embrace the new different and to thrive in it. And I'm starting to get into that place. And that's a good place. Sometimes I miss the old place, but I like my new place. And my kids are okay. All the fears I had are taken care of. I still get to homeschool. I'm not even doing freelance anymore. I got a great job working for a hospital from home flexible hours so I can homeschool um, and I still and then this like I have everything I want I have my own place I rent my own house I have everything I wanted and so much more that I don't even deserve and I would have lived in my parents basement and it would that would have been okay too if that's where you are that's okay too um, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about is from that whole experience of learning to be deliberate take so much of what they've already said taking my thoughts captive um, learning contentment. Um, guys, that's not even my message. <laughs> Sorry. What time is it now? 8.25. Open your Bibles. You have your Bibles? You don't have to. I'll read it too if you don't have it. Colossians chapter 3. If you don't have it, I understand. We're like all over the place. I do want to acknowledge before I talk about stress. So that was stress for me, right? It was a loss. So that's, that's the grief I went through. It's not death kind of loss. That's much, much worse. But it was a loss. Um, and then it was stress. All those fears, I could use the word stress. I was stressed for sure. <laughs> I was under stress. There's different kinds of stress. I want to say right now that I totally acknowledge. Um, we're, we're talking a lot, and Katie and Christy acknowledge this too, about controlling our lives to minimize our stress. There are some things we just cannot control, such as that. 
such as a loss of a job or a layoff or um, getting sick or a loved one getting sick or having a special needs child. There's a lot of stress things in our life that we cannot control. Um, so if I say something and you're like, well, Amy, but I can't help that, just mean that I'm not meaning that situation, okay? Because there's so many situations out there. I do think that we're too stressed out. We carry it around like a badge of honor. You ever go somewhere and you guys say to people, hey, how are you? How was your week? Oh, so stressed. I'm so busy. And uh, once in a while, I think we are in that acute phase of being exceptionally stressed or exceptionally busy. But if that is your, what you always say all the time when people ask, how are you? Something's wrong. Something's off. You need to tweak your life. And that's how I was. So I got into this new, oh, I'm a single mom. And if anybody asked how I was, it was like drama. Oh, I'm a single mom. Now, I was really weepy and sad and on and on and on, but I had to take my thoughts captive. Once I took my thoughts captive and started to change how I think and change how I literally talk, not that words have magic power, I don't mean that, but sometimes you have to fake it till you make it a little bit. Now, you should have some close, tight friends who you can just bear your soul with, and we're supposed to bear one another's burdens. But if a casual acquaintance or everybody at your Shabbat gathering is going to hear it every single Sabbath, I realized I was bringing everybody down all the time. Is that fair to say? Because there's a fine line, because I want to bear their burdens, but I want to help them overcome and to tweak their thoughts, because what if something can't change? What if you're going to be broke for the next two years while you're in school? What if you're all, of course, you're, if you have a special needs kid, you're always going to have a special needs kid. So the situation might stay the same. The circumstances might remain. But how can we look at it differently so that we're not miserable all the time? So that's, and I want to say also, if, if we hear and listen to these things and we think, oh, I'm so glad they talked about that because that person really needs to hear that. I think you've missed the whole point. Because our job is not to point fingers. Like the things I'm saying to you right now, I would never say to you on a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Like, you know, you're bringing the whole group down by your constant prayer request for the same problem over and over and over. I would never say that to you. This is an overall general message, okay? So I, you guys know I have a ton of compassion for people going through hard things. I just want you to live well. Because if you're not... If you're not um, stressed out and woe is me all the time, then you can get busy. And we have things to do. Inside of our miserable situations, which we have from time to time and sometimes a long time, we still have kingdom work to do. And that kingdom work might be raising your special needs kids. It's not putting on retreats necessarily or, or all these amazing things, I guess. Not this, you know. Our mission field is our families. Right? So if you're a mom or you have a husband and they need tending, you tend. I'm not saying everything has to be outside the home. Um, let's read verses 1 through 4. I'm going to have to go so fast. So this is Paul talking, writing a letter. If then you have been raised with Christ. So if you are in Messiah, I read the ESV. Uh, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3. If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Messiah and Elohim. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then also you will appear with him in glory. What's your biggest problem in this world? From the moment you're born, from the moment you're conceived, maybe even. I don't know how that works out, but from the moment we come into this world and we sin for the first time, what's your biggest problem? It's your separation from Yehovah. That's your biggest problem. And that problem has been solved. I feel like Paul is kind of giving a sermon where I'm going to use it to apply to stress. But he starts with reminding us of the gospel. And some people say, well, that's milk. And Paul himself told us, well, the gospel is milk. But you know what? You need the milk. The meat's good, but if you don't have some milk with your meat, you're going to get really thirsty. Don't lose sight of the gospel. Our hope is in Messiah. The work has been done. 
This is not the end. Your problems, your difficulties, life will give us trouble. Our biggest problem has been solved. And when you start to just dwell in yourself so much that you cannot see anything, read the gospel. Your biggest problem is solved. And that's no small thing. You ever go somewhere to a mall or to a big secular event, you just look at the vast amounts of people. You ever just sit there and people watch? Am I the only creepy person? <laughs> and sometimes I'm just overwhelmed, especially maybe when I travel at how many people are on the planet who don't know. And I'm not talking they don't know about Sabbath feasts and eating clean. They don't know there's any hope at all. They don't know that there's a Savior who loved them enough to die for them. And that he's not dead. Every other religion has dead saviors, but anyway. So your biggest problem is solved. That alone should give us hope. And remember, Paul wrote this from prison. So talk about having problems. <laughs> and Paul is not, we're not going to see him in this doing that thing. Oh, woe is me. They locked me up again. It's so unfair. He doesn't take that approach. He doesn't try to bring the people around him down. So everything here is temporary. Focus on the eternal and look above. Let's read verses 5 through 9 now. So put to death, get rid of the things that are earthly in you, like sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. And these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, like anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Oh, I went too far. That's okay. You can never read too much Bible. So the next tip that, if we want to say that Paul is giving us tips on how to have joy, because joy and peace and shalom, they all go together, is to get rid of the junk. I'm going to say a statement, and maybe someday I'll change my mind, but here's where I'm at right now. The biggest source of stress in your life that you can control is your own dirty sin. When we walk in righteousness, you're not going to have any regrets. Walking with regret is rotten. It'll eat you up, and it's because you're a born-again believer who has the Spirit of the living God living inside you, and he just pricks our heart when we're sinning. Small sin, big sin, yellow sin, blue sin, doesn't matter. When you sin, you're going to feel a little rotten inside. That's what I tell my kids. Stop sinning. I'm not going to go through all this list because you guys know all about these sins. Take it in. Analyze your heart as you're walking. Am I feeling stressed out because I just told a little white lie and now I have to remember who I told that to? Am I stressed out because I gossiped yesterday and now that person's here and they're friends with that person and what if they tell them I gossiped? Nothing will bring a community of believers down faster than gossip, especially a community of women. We're really good at Sabbath, eating clean and stuff, but I think our community has to work on gossip, both online and offline. Don't do it. It's stressful. It's even stressful to listen to it, isn't it? Don't even listen to it. Find a polite or, if needed, a rude way to walk away from it. Politely say, Ooh, I don't know that person. I'm out of here. <laughs> you guys can talk, I guess. But just don't listen to it. And it's a trap I fall into all the time. It's so easy. You just want to know what's happening. And maybe you generally want to pray for that person. But man, if it's none of your business, it's none of your business. Just walk away. So these things, we do it every unleavened bread, every Passover. We search our heart for those hidden things. And as this next unleavened bread starts to approach, think of it in the terms of not only is it obedient to get rid of sin, but if you're feeling stressed out, maybe the root of it is in your own wrong behavior. Is that fair to say? And I say this because I've gone through it and am going through it. I'm digging stuff out of my own messy heart too. You ever laid awake at night thinking about your sin? You can't even sleep sometimes because you just have such regrets. Verses 10 and 11. And put on the knowledge of the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of his creator. And here there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Messiah is in all, is all, and it is in all. There's a lot here. I'm going to go really fast. But as I just talked about getting rid of the junk of our lives, 
then Paul says, you're new. So once you've repented of that sin, bury it in the deepest sea. Ask forgiveness from those who need to ask forgiveness from. Make restitution as much as you are able, according to the Torah and beyond. And then let it go. So that that night, now you're going to get good night's sleep because you've done all you can. Do all you can. Let it go. Stop beating yourself up. The enemy loves nothing better than to take a strong believer and beat themselves up with their own guilt. Don't lay in the trap of guilt. I repented of what I needed to repent of. I move on. And that was big. I'm not saying it like it was a light thing, but I had to move on. Right? Get busy. You have kingdom work to do, and guilt will just make you so stuck. Um, so forgive yourself. Okay? You're a sinner saved by grace. Give yourself grace, too. But really, truly, only if you're repented. I'm not preaching the slimy, greasy grace. Repent. Teshuvah. Do the right thing. And then he also says here to stop comparing yourselves to others. You're not better than anyone else. You're not necessarily worse than anyone else. Because what does that even mean? If you sinned on any accord, you've broken the whole law. So any kind of comparing yourself to others as he's better than me or I'm better than him in that is, I think it's foolishness. It's foolishness. It's not fruitful. Um, you, it's fair to say and look at someone in some issue and say, I think they're interpreting that scripture wrong and they're applying it wrongly. But to say I'm better than is very different. Because of the cross and the resurrection, we're all better off than the world because we have a hope of a resurrection. But we're not better than anyone because we're all sinners. We're all lost. We all need a Savior. So we are better off, but we're not better than. Does that make sense? Um, so stop comparing yourself to others and then make Yeshua your only goal. Just look at him, look at how he walked, look at how he carried out Torah. And for the parts that aren't mentioned, remember they said he did so much more they couldn't even write it down. Couldn't even fill up the books. Don't you wish they had? <laughs> um, look to Yeshua, make him your aim, make him your goal. And don't look to other people in the sense like they're walking rightly. I want her to mentor me and stuff like that. But you know what really stresses us out is comparing ourselves to each other in these more superficial ways, isn't it? So let's not, let's stop comparing. I've even heard it this weekend, and we mean well, but we've got to watch how we think, um, oh, I'm, you're so good at that. I could never do that. I'm not good at that. And I, sometimes I don't know how to take that. I don't know really, I don't really explore it a lot, but if you're just complimenting someone, good. But if deep down you're like, I wish I was as good at that as her, then you're comparing yourself to her, and you don't need to do that. Compare yourself to Yeshua only. Stop wanting each other's gifts. I'm learning this. I look at some of you with the most beautiful, amazing gifts, and I'm like, I want that. I covet that gift because they shine in that way. And it's foolishness, and it brings me down, and it stresses me out. And it makes me feel not good enough, right? You ever feel not good enough comparing yourself to other women? Oh. We have to stop it. Um, there's always going to be someone who cooks better, someone who writes better, someone who dresses better, someone who has more money, someone who's skinnier, someone who has more kids. There was one lady who, who told me, I talked to a lot of women, not tons, because I don't have a ton of time, but different women contact me with different things, and um, she said, I feel ashamed to go to Sabbath fellowship because I only have one kid. I know, right? And I decided to, you know, I hate for people to feel alone. I just hate that. <laughs> so I explored it with her, and I said, well, she says, they all have lots of kids. And to her, three kids is a lot, because she has one kid. And then she started telling me all the reasons why she has one kid. And I said, stop, stop, stop. I don't think you're a sinner, because you only have one kid. <laughs> like, you don't have to tell me all the details of why you have one kid. There's a million reasons why someone might have one kid. A million reasons. And I said, why do you feel like they look down on you? And, she's, and we explored it, and in the end, she couldn't really nail it down. I think she was pulling that out. She, not that she was frivolously, but she sort of invented that in her mind, which is even sadder, right? Like, it's one thing if there's people who are actually looking down on her and saying, we're more holy because we went forth and multiplied. 
which by the way is taking a little out of context. You don't have to have a whole slew of kids. If he did, he would open up all her wombs and on and on and on and on. That would be one thing. She could find another fellowship, but she just internalized that. And somehow she felt that. And she's a nice lady. It's not like she's prideful or arrogant, but she felt that because she's comparing herself to other families. Stop doing that. Whatever it is, I think this is our biggest joy stealer of women in every community, secular, Christian, Hebrew, whatever. We compare ourselves to other women, and it's our culture. We're mostly, we're Americans here. People will listen to this from around the world, you guys. There's Torah sisters around the world. They will listen to this, and they will agree with me when I tell them Americans are really, we can be superficial. Is that okay to say? And it, it's true, right? And it affects us because we're here. Now, we're different. I think, I hope we're less superficial than the world because we have this book to tell us what really matters. But we can still be really superficial. So stop, create, I'm going to really stop and dwell on this for a minute, even though I have so much to talk about because I just think this is such a joy killer. We've got to stop desiring other people's gifts too. When it comes to spiritual gifts, the Bible is really clear. You don't get them all. You don't get them all. And it can be really glamorous, like it's super weird that I'm up here holding the microphone because I used to think, I desire that, blah, 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 blah. Nonsense. I have seen some of the most beautiful spiritual gifts in this room, and if we don't all cling to our gifts and we're all doing the same thing, we're going to fall apart. And this is stuff we all know. We're a body, fingers, toes, pinky toes, all this stuff, right? And it's this thing that we think about, but it really, I don't think we're living it out well. You're so good at that. I wish I could do that. No, no, no. You can say you're so good at that. It's okay to dish out compliments, but stop at that. I wish I could do that. Just stop. Don't do that. And then on the flip side, try to find your spiritual gifts. And try to, and one way to do that is to listen to what other people are saying. Can I tell them our little story? Jessica, Jessica, right? Jessica came up to me a little bit ago and she said, Amy, in love, can I tell you something? And I said, yup. And she said, I feel like we should pray more. And I said, yeah, you're right. I was telling someone else. I kind of blow past it. I kind of forget about it, I guess. Shame on me, but I do. I plan these things out, and I don't really plan a lot of time for group prayer. And I had noticed that this morning. Um, and then I looked at her, and it dawned on me, that's probably your gift. Isn't there a spiritual gift of intercession where you just there's certain people in our communities who just have that burning desire to to be in the spirit and to pray a lot and to talk to the Father. And they will sometimes stop and interrupt and say, let's just praise him right now. Let's just hold hands and praise him if it's a good thing, or let's hold hands and pray if it's a hard thing. So I think you have that gift, and I don't think I do. <laughs> and that's why I should probably be planning this with more ladies on my side and not just me. So it's a good example. I don't have that gift, but she does. And so I said, you're going to pray today. <laughs> so compliment each other. Try to draw out each other's gifts and stop desiring what someone else has. I don't know how many gifts we're all dished out. Some of us might have more. It just means we have more going on or we need them. I think the, the Father gives us certain gifts at different times in our lives when they're needed. And then it might go away again. So be open to someone says, you know, our community, our, our fellowship, whatever, is going through a crisis. We need this. Or, or you might be the—see, what I think will happen is you'll be the one to notice it. That person's going with a hard time. They need some hospitality. They need some meals. Let's get it going. That person needs some prayer. Let's get it going. That person needs some encouragement. Let's get it going. All these things are really important. Don't wait for someone else to do it. It might be your gift. Just do it. And then that need might go away, and you don't need to display that gift for a while. So be flexible. We're the clay, right? He's the potter. Be flexible with him. Okay. You're beautiful women. You have so much important work. And a lot of you, we're doing it. We're doing that important work. I'm not saying, like, you're sitting at home doing nothing. I know you're not doing nothing because <laughs> I talk to you. Um, let's read verses 12 to 14 real quick. 
So put on as God's chosen ones, that's pretty special, holy and beloved, set apart and called his own. Again, if that's who we are, we get to be these ones who know Messiah, our biggest problem is solved. So then we're going to put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Father has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So I said our biggest joy killer is when we sin. Our biggest joy getter is showing love. I'm not going to dwell on this because the other ladies have done a great job. Give of yourself generously. Um, when we have that mantra constantly of, I'm so busy, it sort of shuts things down and people think you're unavailable to them, especially your family. I have learned to stop talking about how busy I am and how it's hard being a single mom because I realize my kids are listening to that junk. <sighs> Why would I want them to think my life is hard? My life is wonderful. Now I tell them all the time, we have a great life. And we'll talk about that more in a second. So I love them. I give generously to them. And I'm available to them. And they know that because I don't talk about being unavailable. Now there's always Shabbat. And Shabbat is the special set apart time, not just for us to rest, but for us to invest in other people too. And sometimes we forget about that. Be deliberate about using your Shabbat to pray with others take them a meal, all these things, all these things. If you think you don't have time to show love, I'm going to say to you, you have your Shabbats, okay? Shabbats are not just to take a nap and rest. It could be your time to go show love. It doesn't mean, you know, take them to the bowling alley because that's not permitted in Shabbat. But within a way that's permissible, permissible on Shabbat, there's a lot of ways to love people on Shabbat. A lot of people can't go to fellowship because they don't have a ride. Go and pick them up. Um, I want to dwell for a second on what he says about forgive. It doesn't say to only forgive people when they repent. It doesn't say to forgive people when they say I'm sorry. And it doesn't say to forgive people when they change. It just says to forgive. And if you haven't guessed, <laughs> this is what I had to do. And uh, you don't have to go through something big and awful to have a lack of forgiveness in your heart somewhere, which we also do before Passover in a big way. Um, and this might take a while. I want If you say, I f we've all been wronged by people, maybe, maybe yesterday, maybe right before you came here. I don't know. We all get wronged by people, intentionally or in unintentionally. We get our feelings hurt. People wrong us got to let it go 70 times 7. And then never, ever hold a grudge. And by holding a grudge, those thoughts of they owe me. They owe me an apology. They owe me this. They owe me that. And I'm going to go tell someone else. If you find yourself telling someone about the wrong, you might not have forgiven them. If you find yourself waiting for justice, you might not have really actually forgiven them. Forgiveness is so many things, and I won't dwell on it so long because that could be a whole weekend too, but it's at least saying they owe me nothing, and I release them from that. That's really powerful, and it might take a long time, I can tell you. It might take a long time. You might have to do it over and over and over again when those thoughts of wanting justice well up in you. Yeah, you might have to do it over and over. <laughs> So when those thoughts creep up, you squish them, you dig in, and you release it again. And you should tell them one time, I release you, you don't owe me anything. Now it doesn't mean that everything is okay and the relationship is restored. Restoration and reconciliation of a relationship is a whole different thing and sometimes that's not possible. But forgiveness is commanded, therefore it must be possible, right? It must be something we're capable of doing. Um, so you, I recommend you call the person and you tell them. And you saw what happened earlier. Sometimes they don't even know they did it or it wasn't even a thing. And you just made it up in your head. <laughs> Good, fine. But then you can sleep at night. Don't go to bed angry. Don't go to bed with a lack of forgiveness. The Bible is full of promises that God will do justice his way in his timing. Full of promises. That is not our job. And we hear it, or this was me. I heard it and heard it and heard it. 
and believed it, but I wasn't living it. So what, did I really believe it? No. If I don't live out the forgiveness, I don't really believe it. And by that, I mean, I knew that God gets his justice, but I also was waiting for justice. And I thought I knew when justice should come and how it should look. <laughs> it's not our job to get justice. It's not our job at all. Don't talk about it. Don't dwell on it. Forgive and let it go. You might need safe limits and boundaries and all those healthy things, but it, that's between you and God. And once you let it go, sweet shalom. Sweet, sweet shalom. Let it go. And so that brings us to verse 15. Right? Is that where we are? Yep. Let the peace of Messiah rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. So one of Paul's tickets to peace is to have an attitude of gratitude. So now, when I, I don't talk about being a single mom hardly ever. I talk about my life, but I don't use the words single mom together very much. I'm a mom, I'm single, this is my situation. But I don't say it the way the culture says, like, oh, I'm a single mom. I just don't do that. It messes with my head when I say it all the time. I'm changing my, my language and how I think to put a spin on it, I guess. But it's a truthful spin. There's a lot of perks to being single. And so I've analyzed those perks to death. <laughs> if you want a list of all the perks of being single, come see me, I'll tell you. <laughs> Not that I wish that for any of you, but that's what I had to do, right? I have to count my blessings. I can park in the garage any old way I want, and I can spread out in the bed. Two fun places where it's just spread out. Because <laughs> parking tight in a garage is not fun either. There's more. I can do this. I don't think I could have pulled this off if I had a husband, to be honest. I've thought about that. It's a weird thing to think about. That in his, in the Father's all-knowing, allowing terrible sins to take place, he can make beauty from that, right? I'm telling you, if I, if I were married still, we wouldn't be here doing this. That's a weird thing to think about. He's got a plan. Got to trust him with the plan and only look at what he needs to show you right now. Is this okay? Is this helpful? Probably saying stuff you already know. But you know what I realized after sitting through a lot of conferences and, and sermons and things? Someone, sometimes hearing the same old thing is good for us. We need to let it soak in over and over and over. And I'm not just telling you things that I think you and you and you need to work on. It's all from here. This is all Ian knows. This is all the stuff I worked through because she's, you've counseled me tons, you know. Um, so change your attitude. So instead of saying, oh, kids, we're going to have a really busy day. We have to go to the dentist. We have to go to piano lessons. And then we have a, a doctor's appointment or whatever it is. Now I say, we have an awesome day because we get to go to the dentist because mommy has dental insurance and we get to take care of your teeth. And for a lot of people, they can't have that. And that's a privilege. So we get to go to the dentist, and then you get to have piano lessons because mommy is so blessed, I can even give you piano lessons. That's a luxury item. And their dad and I choose to do that for them because every family values different kinds of luxury items. We all have luxury items, I think. That's one that we have chosen. Um, and then we get to do this. So that's how I frame things out. I can look at it as, oh, we have so many errands to do. It's going to be so busy. Or I can say, we get to do these things. What a privilege it is that we live here. We have money. We have all these things. Every time you find yourself saying, I have to, see if you can change it to a we get to. See if this thing that's such a drag is actually a privilege and a blessing. Come on, we have to. I've even said it about going to Shabbat fellowships. Come on, we have to go. We have to go. Like, what? <laughs> we get to go. There are people all around the world who don't have anywhere to go, and they would drive hours and hours. And I'm complaining about driving one hour. We get to go, and we have a tank full of gas because the father is good, and mommy has a job, and we have a tank full of gas. And it's no big deal for us to drive an hour. For some families, they don't go because they, don't, they can't afford a tank full of gas to drive an hour. Find out who they are and give them a tank full of gas so they can go to Shabbat. So when you change your attitude from we, I have to to I get to, it can change your whole life. 
It can change your whole focus, and not just with errands. Look at everything. Look at your difficult relationships. Look at um, difficult husbands sometimes, difficult kids. Try to find the beauty where there was complaining. The Father does not owe you anything. And I had to work through that. I had this, he owes me mentality. God owes me. He doesn't owe me anything. That's playing the victim. And when I'm playing the victim, I'm stuck. I'm so stuck when I'm a victim. So I'm choosing not to be a victim. I'm choosing to be a daughter of the king who's blessed, who calls me beloved. And I have all these privileges. So when you, put, when you say to the father, it's not fair, you're acting like a spoiled child. Because what is fair? I can tell you what fair is. And it's not the resurrection and a new heaven and a new earth that we get to live in forever in his presence. That's not fair either, but we get that. I think everything comes back to the gospel. Is that fair to say? Everything, all of these heart issues that we wrestle with, all of it comes back to the gospel in one way or another. So forgive me if I go there a lot. I'm trying to keep my eye on the prize when I go through these things. We're going to have to pick it up tomorrow, and that's okay. <laughs> I don't talk ever. This is my first time ever talking. I have way too many notes. You guys are awesome. Let's pray, and then uh, I'm going to pray. And Can we sing it again? And then we can you kind of use it also as a, while we're seeing Days of Elijah. You can go to the bathroom, get a drink, get a coffee, whatever. You can leave, <laughs> go fluff your hair, go to the hot tub, whatever you want to do. And then after Days of Elijah, if you want to... <laughs> <laughs> if you want to hear me talk about my vision for Taurus Sisters, what's ending and what's in, the st in store for Taurus Sisters, hang out right here after the song. Is that okay? All right, let me pray. Father Abba, you are good. You are full of grace and mercy. May we never forget that. When we start to feel stressed and we start to feel the weight of the world and burdens and things that really are hard, help us to maintain our focus on, on the cross, on Yeshua, he showed us how to live. He showed us how to love. He was never stressed. He never worried about, oh, no, there's just this many fish and loaves. What are we going to eat? He just called out to you. Help us to be like him in all of these ways. Help us to dig into the word, to believe it, to practice it. May we be encouragers to one another, never, ever comparing ourselves to one another, lifting each other up and even more as the day of his return approaches. We love you, Father. We thank you for all the goodness in our lives, and in Yeshua's name, amen. Let's sing.